Uh, Robert Herman has been a street photographer since the days, uh, his days as an N NYU uh, film student in the late 1970s. Using his father's Nikon F and a 50 millimeter lens, he began exploring the city um, as a means to connect both with people uh, in his neighborhood and, a, and as a way of learning the craft of image making. Um, his photos of New York City shot between 1978 and 2005 on Kodachrome are now collected in his first monograph, The New Yorkers, uh, which is now in its second printing, which is pretty amazing. Um, and there are copies here for you, for you guys tonight. Uh, his work is part of the permanent collections of the George Eastman House and the Telfair Museum in Savannah, Georgia. His photographs are also in many private collections, including uh, the Westin and Marriott Hotels. In 2011, uh, images from New Yorkers were exhibited at the Istanbul um, uh, Photography Museum. And most recently, his um, solo exhibition, A Walking Dream, was shown at the Museum of Modern Art <coughs> in Cartagena, um, Colombia. Um, Robert has his BFA in filmmaking from Tisch School of Arts in New York, at New York University. And, like I said, uh, he received his Master of Professional Studies in Digital Photography uh, from, here, from here at the School of Visual Arts. So by f we are definitely um, feel very connected and very proud of Robert's success. So we're really happy to have him here. Please welcome Robert Herman. Thanks, Tom. Hi. Um, first, I want to say that I'm really uh, honored to come back to the school I graduated from and talk about my work. Um, when I went to SVA in 2008, it was just the second year of the program, and um, there were only 16 of us, so it was a big deal just to get in. And I can definitely tell you that going through this program with Katrin and Tom uh, as the chairs was a life-changing experience for me. And it got me really uh, um, focused and motivated again, and I did learn something. Okay. So anyway, um, I'm going to talk about the New Yorkers tonight, and this is the book cover. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of the images and also how I produced the book. And as a little extra special thing at the end, I'm going to show you some pictures from this new book I'm working on called The Phone Book. Um, so here's the cover. And this is a self-portrait that starts the book that I took in 1981. Um, and I had a beard then and glasses. And I was really into shooting uh, reflections. And you know, I got the idea of holding the camera down here and getting some good framing from a portrait somebody took of Vim Vendors, the filmmaker that I saw in a film magazine. And he was taking a picture of the guy who was taking a picture of him and held the camera down here. And this was one of my favorites. And um, I called it a self-portrait in a flower shop window. And the next slide is just to show you how the page is laid out at the beginning of the book. And uh, the designer, Patty Fabricant, did an amazing job of um, putting this book together and picking the right font and which picture went where until I started messing around with it you know, as we move towards printing. So I'm just going to show you some of the pictures from the book. This is the first picture from the main, uh, in the main body of the book. When I first started shooting, um, it was around 1978, um, and I took a couple of, uh, introductory photo classes at NYU and we were printing and shooting black and white and um, you know I, I found that I actually had a knack for this and I started shooting color negative and then one day I decided to try shooting um, slide film which is very difficult to shoot because it's very unforgiving if the exposure is off a stop in one di direction or the other uh, you basically don't have an image um, so the thing I think that makes this interesting as a body of work is when I was making these pictures, I was actually teaching myself how to make pictures. And that kind of process of discovery and surprise at um, what makes a good picture um, and learning a language that you kind of fall in love with 
a little bit at a time every day, and you discover new things about how to find a picture basically out of the normal everyday street life that we all look at every day. How do you get inside of that, um, sort of see in between the lines, so to speak, and find something that has a little bit of um, lightning in a bottle that you can bring back and show people? And, you know, the early pictures like this one, um, they kind of kept me inspired to keep going, you know, because it's kind of a lonely job. I mean, you go out every day, um, you bring three or four rolls of film. Um, most of the pictures you take at the, um, every day are really honestly suck. The good ones are the like, when you've kind of gotten past all the noise in your head and something opens up and time slows down and you start to really see. Now back in the day when you were shooting film, every shot, every frame was going to cost you something. So you start to find a way to kind of be a um, sort of a zen approach to shooting on the street and listen to your body and go wherever the day takes you, so to speak. And, um, you know, to me it was like, it was very therapeutic. It was really interesting. I had done a lot of reading um, of some, you know, uh, one critic named John Berger who really inspired me and looked at uh, photo books like Frank's The Americans and Callahan's Color Book. And, you know, you have sort of an idea in your head of what makes a strong picture, and then you go out and try to find something that you think is close but still has a voice, your own voice. And this is what this book represents, is my journey of discovery back in the 80s and the late 70s. And of course, a lot of the photos in this book are from Soho. And this is before Soho became a mall. Um, and it was just a neighborhood. The artists had just maybe had been there for five years. But the, um, the people who had lived there for a long time still lived there. And it had a lot of richness and color um, and life in it that I really related to. Uh, this picture was, this graffiti was done by an artist named Rene, obviously. And um, he was really angry that uh, the big galleries in Soho wouldn't show his work. So he put this up that says, I am the best artist. It's outside the frame. And I had a lot of fun when I was making the titles for the book. And I decided to call this picture, This Is Not Rene. Does anybody know why that's funny? Um, basically, it's because of Rene Magritte did a, um, a picture called This Is Not a Pipe. And uh, when I was putting the book together, there was about um, a month of 20-hour days trying to tune this thing up to bring it to the printer. And I kept refining and changing the titles. And that's what I finally came up with, with this one. Anyway, let's keep going. Uh, this is right on the corner of Lafayette, where the, um, the Duane Reed is now. It used to be the East River Savings Bank. And, you know, part of being a street photographer, sort of being a voyeur and being a spy and being invisible. And this is a good example of that. And it expresses a lot of those ideas in one photo. Um, here we go. <laughs> and this will give you an idea of how um, I always said that you don't have to travel around the world to get a good photo. Um, this is right across the street from my apartment. I just walked out there one day and I saw this kid in the car and I just couldn't resist, obviously. Okay. And this is an interesting photo because this is where the Trump Soho is now. So Soho is a completely different place. Um, obviously undeveloped in, in 30, 35 years, things have changed quite a bit there. And I don't know if it's for the better or worse, but. All I can say is you should have bought this piece of property. <laughs> and um, this is one of the last picture in the main body of the book. And to me, it's one of the most significant pictures. Um, that's Basquiat's graffiti that means uh, same old thing is dead. And I didn't know who Basquiat was when I took the picture, but I was attracted to the blue jeans and the, the words. And later on, I realized that the picture was red, white, and blue and said something about America. But there's another interesting part of this story is that 
Back in 2000, um, I did a solo show at a gallery on 20th Street called Clonochrome, and this was the postcard image. And one night, uh, when I was having a rough time, I was staring at the postcard, and I realized that it was a very autobiographical picture. Um, I, had, I was bipolar, but I had, um, didn't get diagnosed for a while until about um, 1992. And when I took this picture in 81, um, you know, it was just a photo that I thought was really strong. And when I was staring at the postcard, I realized that um, before and after you have a nervous breakdown, it's like two different people. Your old self is kind of gone, and you're reinventing yourself. And so that, I put this picture at the end sort of to talk about that. In a, you know, obviously, it's not in the book in words. But if you look through the book, there's a progression possibly that you could read the book backwards to the front instead of front to back. And to me, this picture um, kind of is a, a mile marker in my life. Um, and the funny thing is this picture is actually the first color photo I ever made that I really thought was a strong photo. And that's in t uh, the Times Square subway station back in 1980. And <gasps> And you know, to me, what I was trying to do was learn the language of how uh, things talk to each other in the frame. And obviously, when I saw, you see, you don't think of these things when you do it. It's only afterwards um, that you get an, um, an idea of what you actually have been able to capture and bring back. And when you see the combination of the Dudley Moore's cane and this guy's cane, and the irony of what it says, he wanted to be Moses, but he didn't have the right connections. Um, it's kind of like magic. And, um, you know, how do you teach somebody to go out in the street and find this stuff? I think you can talk about it, but the only real way to do it is to practice and to go out and shoot a lot and somehow um, trust your uh, instincts and paying attention to the details. And the interesting thing about this photo is. Um, while I was in NYU, I was trying to get work as a production still photographer, and I was working on films um, basically for free to get a portfolio. And after I got out of school, I was looking for work, and I, uh, I heard about a film that was going to be shot in New York, a low-budget independent film, but it actually had a budget um, for a change. And I went to see the producer, and I showed him a portfolio of these kind of street photography pictures. And when he saw this one, he hired me, which was a shock, let me tell you because I thought I had to show them, you know, talking heads, talking to each other, and all kinds of stuff. So you never know. All you can do is show them what you've got that you think is your best work. Um, and this is the corner of West Broadway and Spring Street back in 78. And I was kind of being sneaky that day. I was like crouched down against the wall and trying to catch something as it went by. And um, I'm sort of giving you a neighborhood tour here. This is the, the corner of Lafayette and Spring, where Spring Street Natural is. This was kind of a, um, a crumb, crumb, kind of a crummy coffee shop back in those days. I didn't even want to eat there myself. But I love shooting through windows, getting reflections of what's going on behind me and what's inside the uh, restaurant. And I've been fascinated by that, and I still am. And actually, this movie, I mean, this picture was made when I was shooting on the movie I got the job on. Uh, we'd, um, you'd be working on a film set, you know, basically you're parked in a parking lot waiting for the light to change until the director's happy, and you could be there for weeks doing nothing. And then when they finally get around to shooting something, it takes 10 minutes, and then you go back and wait some more. So I was still learning how to take pictures, and oh, even though they were paying me to do the production sales, I was really bored. And I would buy my own Kodachrome every, uh, and have a big supply with me every week. And while they were waiting around for the light to change, I would shoot the neighborhood. And this was the first, one of the first successful pictures I made. And it's basically because um, they were paying me to do nothing all day, and I wasn't going to just sit there and, and uh, wait to do the shots. And this is Greenpoint. Um, and it was just like a magical day with all this wash and the sunlight. And, you know, it's like when you see something like that in your photographer, you go, oh my God, I just hit the jackpot. And you just shoot it. And you keep shooting until you get something that you think is as close 
to uh, what you're happy with. Now, the other day I was watching a, um, a video that Sam Abel did talking about his work. And he, he, told, he told a story about his father, um, who was a photographer as well. Sam Abel is a National Geographic photographer. And he was talking about this idea that when you see something interesting, you compose the picture and then you wait. And when you wait, something magical happens, like these two kids walking by. And I remember when I first realized um, that that's really a great strategy for a street photographer to find something that's an interesting composition that speaks to you and not just take a picture and walk away, but look, keep looking through the frame and see what kind of random uh, thing will happen that will make the picture so much better than what it was. If you could imagine this without the kids, it's not the same photo. But, and there's another story that goes with this, and this is kind of interesting, is I was living on a, in a loft on Kemmerer Street at the time, and I was, you know, sitting at the kitchen table with my girlfriend at the time, and all of a sudden I said to her, um, I just have to go out and shoot for a few minutes. And I walked around the corner, this is Mulberry Street, and I saw these two cars, I took like five pictures, came back home, and there it was. And I had no idea why something said to me, go out and shoot this. So there's some kind of, you know, I don't want to call it woo-woo, whatever. <laughs> something tunes, you, tunes into you, the universe meets you halfway, and if you listen in a, uh, in a receptive way and act on what you hear, Sometimes it's just telling you to take a walk around the corner, even though it makes no sense, and, and something magical happens. And I think that really kind of um, um, is really what I've been doing all these years, is kind of listening for that voice. And sometimes you walk around for three or four days taking pictures, and you don't really get any um, inspiration. But part of your job as a photographer is that to go out and shoot even when you don't feel like it, because you never know when that inspiration is going to happen. And obviously, opportunity is, comes to those who are prepared. And um, so you do it. You know? And sometimes, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that when you get a gift like this, it kind of shows you what, a, um, uh, what I've been trying to do, which is capture lightning in a bottle. And maybe that's a superficial way of looking at it, or maybe it's really deep. I don't know. But, you know, all I have is the evidence of what I've done and, um, you know, obviously the editing of taking out um, all the stuff that I don't want you to see. And here's another example of composing and waiting. Um, I had framed up this storefront because of the mannequin in the window and the beautiful shadows. And then this guy runs into the frame and jumps up on this wall. And because I was prepared and ready, I got the picture. And you can't plan this stuff, but you can be ready for it. And, uh, and to me, you know, these are the things that make you want to get up in the morning and do it again. And you know, here's a little simpler version of that. Um, it's funny, I was on Spring Street the other day, and this storefront is still empty. 35 years later, it's got like a little art installation inside. And I'm like on, um, I guess on Green Street, and that guy's on Spring Street, I'm looking through two windows. But without the guy in the window, you don't really have a photo. And that's another example of, you know, something happening to complete the composition or give it some meaning or um, just make something happen. And here again is another idea where, you know, I saw these stripes, I shot a whole roll of film of people passing by. And it would actually be interesting to show you the sequencing of how this, but this is the best photo in terms of uh, my edit. And I guess what I'm trying to tell you is that I'd say 60% of being a good photographer is being an editor. Um, we all can shoot pictures every day, and it's easier and easier to do that. And learning how to be kind of really hard on the images you're taking in terms of what's good and what isn't it was a real struggle for me because you're so subjective 
and it's hard to step back and really see what you've done. And you know, when when you when you really finally get to that point where you can really see what's going on, and then you realize this is a photo that's not just about composition, it's about vision, it's about looking, it's about not being able to see. And to me, that's what I like about photography is how it talks about the medium and how we all look at the world. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures in the book because when I was putting the book together, I went through 25,000 slides. And I didn't know I had this one. And that's why I always say don't throw anything out. Especially you digital people, where it's easy to delete things, you never know if you have something beautiful or meaningful hanging around somewhere um, until you come back with fresh eyes 10 years later. And you know, I was thrilled when I found this. And here, I'm just gonna show you a few more pictures um, just to give you an idea of what the book looks like. I think there's a lot of pictures of children in the book because when I was making these pictures, I felt um, very vulnerable. I related to the kids, you know, the poor kids in my neighborhood who played out on the street, and I felt like there was some kind of emotional connection. Um, I felt like I was still a kid in certain ways, and I could understand what it was like to be out in the city, um, sort of exposed emotionally and at the same time trying to uh, lose yourself and have fun. And, you know, this was all taken down. You know, this is LaGuardia Place. Uh, and of course, you know, once in a while you just, you're in the right time in the right place with the right culture. <laughs> and uh, you get these two guys, this guy and his girlfriend. And, um, you know, maybe I was a lot braver in those days, but I could go up to people and just ask them to take, if I could take their picture, and they were like, okay. Um, they actually used to make things in Soho. Uh, this is like Elizabeth Street or Mott Street back in 1984. And, you know, the thing that always attracts me to photographs before the subject is the light. And I'm really, really um, in love with direct sunlight at the end of the day or early in the morning. And of course, when I saw this guy sitting there, it was like a Rembrandt kind of lighting. And you just, you know, it's irresistible. Um, and I think a lot of the pictures in my book are all really about light first, color second, and subject third, you know? And, and here's another photo that I took very early in when I was shooting, probably in 78 or 79. And, you know, I was learning how to compose things and learn how to um, take something really mundane, like, a, um, like an old chair in, in front of a storefront, and make it into something more. And I think that's part of what I really try to do, is say that um, there's something really uh, transcendent in the everyday, if you can sort of put a, a frame around it, amplify it, make it visible to yourself and other people. And to me, that's a hopeful thing in a kind of world that seems a little bit, uh, not a little bit, very despairing quite, quite a bit of the time. It's sort of my rebellion against despair. Um, to say that this mundanity that we walk by all the time actually means something, has some uh, um, value. This is Sheridan Square. And this is uh, Footlight Records on Mercer Street. She's playing pinball, by the way. <coughs> and here's another example of uh, light and shadows making something uh, uh, interesting for me. Um, another thing I really like to do is ride the subway where uh, it wasn't illuminated by fluorescence. 
And, you know, out in Astoria, um, on the 7 train, you get out in the daylight and it's like the, the subway cars are transformed. And like the picture of the train conductor, um, the lighting is what makes these photos come alive. You can imagine what this would have been like underground somewhere. I mean, it might be a good photo of this woman, but it wouldn't have this kind of uh, power. And here's a good example of how juxtaposing things and waiting tells a story. Um, the name of this picture is a, it's a white man's world. And um, I guess when I was trying to make the titles for the book, you know, I got to kind of try to create a title that would tell you something but not tell you too much, but just give you a hint of what I was thinking uh, either when I took the picture or when I looked at it. One of my favorite things to do is to take a picture and see how much stuff I can put into it um, and it still works somehow with all the layers of uh, reflection and light and shadow um, and the people across the street and the frame. Um, this is a picture about picture making. And here's just a decisive moment in the classic sense of being in the right place at the right time and somebody, th somebody throwing some plastic out of the puck building but somehow that makes a photo. Um, and this is interesting because of how mundane the source material of this is. I was in a garage on Kenmore Street and the light was reflecting off the hood of a car. And I saw this, um, I was really into, um, um, I guess you could say, uh, Rauschenberg and de Kooning and Rothko and I liked making photos that were sort of an imitation, my, my homage to uh, abstract painting. And, you know, I, I, I would hon honestly seek this kind of stuff out if I saw it and figure out a way to make an interesting uh, photo. And I always thought um, that they would make good photos if they were printed really big, which is what I ended up doing with this. I know I'm jumping around a lot. Um, but I'll just kind of keep going. This is one of the few pictures in the book that's outside of the borough of Manhattan. This is in East New York in 1992 or 94. And to me, what makes this photo is the guy in the red shirt in the corner on the bottom over there. It's just that one little detail that pushes the photo um, into more than just a document. And this is right around the corner from that. <coughs> and this one's from Staten Island. Uh, you know, I'm, Kodachrome is really notoriously good for red. And, you know, of course, this is like a candy store for me to see this kind of color. This is on the train to Astoria. And this is in Brooklyn Heights on Court Street on the 4th of July. And I used to pass these guys on West Broadway all the time. And I actually photographed this guy a lot. but. Um, for the book, this is the one I picked because the um, the two different cultures in the picture, you know, the punk people, the clash, and these guys who've been there forever, and you know, it just worked. Um, you can't plan this stuff. Let me tell you. <laughs> Um, this was when I um, was shooting uh, in Astoria again, and I'm going to show you the next picture. Um, these two pictures are on two, uh, facing pages in the book, and one of the joys of putting a book together is how these 
left and right pages talk to each other. And I just thought it was interesting with these two flags and these two old guys in a bar uh, next to these two kind of uh, poor kids on the street. And to me, finding these pairings um, and putting them in a book um, gives the book some richness, even if uh, the people looking at the book aren't conscious of it maybe the first time. But it's some kind of connections are made. Um, and that's me, uh, my shadow. I mean, there's a whole tradition of uh, self-portraits, and I'm sure you've seen some of Vivian Meyer's work lately, and of course Friedlander uh, in the past. And I was always studying all the photographers and um, tr trying to take their ideas and incorporate them into what, what I was trying to do. Um, and I'm sure you're familiar with this building on Houston Street. I'm still alive, and I took this guy's picture. <laughs> and this is actually a friend of mine. Vinny uh, um, was a film student when I was a film student at NYU. And I used to go out to Brooklyn and hang out with him. And he really did dress this way, not just for movies. This is, <laughs> and his, you know, he had a 62 pink electric convertible that we drive around. And, uh, you know, we'd go get uh, pizza. He said, give me a square. So it was really fun to hang out with him. Um, it was like a whole, like me entering a whole different world. And this is on 6th Avenue. And I was, honestly, because of Frank, I was always uh, attracted to flags and um, trying to have them part of a picture and say something interesting that wasn't a cliche. Now here I'm going to show you some spreads from the book and how they kind of uh, talk to each other. See. To me, this is one of my favorites because of the diagonals. See how that works. This was the first one I found for the book. And when I had this one, I said, OK, if I can get another 50 that's, that are even <laughs> close to this, maybe I have something here. So you know, six, 27 iterations later, that's what you've got now. And uh, um, this is one of the only two double pages in the book, where there's one picture on two pages. And it you know, um, just seemed to work for, for the book. I mean, there's a million choices you make when you do one of these things. And this is the last page. And it's the newest picture in the book. And it's a reflection of, uh, in a puddle in Williamsburg. So um, to, before I move on, I just maybe talk about self-publishing. I'm sure people want to hear about that. Um, to start with, I made a book dummy um, sort of like the dummies you make with blurb. And uh, I went to some portfolio reviews with this dummy that had a different cover and showed it to you know, uh, museum curators and book publishers. And just to go back a little bit, the year before I had gone to a portfolio review and just showed him a stack of 8 by 10 prints with the same more or less the same images and didn't get much of a response. And then the next year, I went back with a book dummy and somehow something magical happened where when people hold a physical book in their hand, it changes the way they see it. Um, one of the people I showed the book to um, was Sean Cochran, who is a curator at the Museum of the City of New York. And he said, you know, man, you got something here. And so if you guys are interested in making a book, the best way to find out what you've got, and it's not that expensive, is to make a book dummy or make 10 book dummies and keep changing it around until you get something that you're happy with. Um, so I had this book dummy, and I started showing it to publishers. And a few of them were interested. But you know, I don't know how much this is. It's sort of an open secret. But most of the big publishers, if you're an unknown photographer, are going to ask you to put up twenty-five dollars to $50,000 to pay for the printing and the marketing. And then you're going to release the book. And maybe it'll do well, maybe it won't. But 
you probably won't make any money on. But you will have a book out there, which is a great thing. But because I didn't have $47,000, um, I decided to do a Kickstarter campaign. And that Kickstarter campaign, not only did it raise about $10,000, it was also a way to test, uh, what's the word, proof of concept? OK, so when 137 people said that this was something they were interested in, it kind of gave me the guts to keep going. Um, I think when I started this book, started putting this together, I, maybe seven years ago, I just had the idea that I had a body of work that would work together as a book. But to take that from that idea and take it all the way to the point where it gets printed, um, you need a lot of encouragement, not just from your friends and uh, the people who care about you, but you need a feedback loop from uh, the world to kind of tell you they're on the right track. And so self-publishing as, um, um, as a way of getting a book out there is, is, has a lot of really good points in the sense that you have complete control over the final product. You can hire the designer you want, which I did, who is Patty Fabricant. She did a great job. Um, I could hire the editor, who is Stella Kramer. And she did um, really help me um, refine this uh, sequencing. And you know, a lot of the times when you give a book to a publisher, they want to pick the cover. They want to tell you how it's going to look. So you know, if you if you can keep the control over it and you know what you're doing, you actually get a book that you're really proud of. Um, the downside is, is that then you have to figure out how to market it. You have to figure out how to um, get it out in the world and do your own publicity. And you know, just the Kickstarter campaign took two months, and I was on the computer every day, for two hours, trying to get people interested in this. But in the end, you know, the book cost about thirty thousand dollars, and by doing it myself, I actually made the money back which is actually amazing. If you um, have any idea of how uh, hard it is to even sell a 1,000 copies of a photo book. Um, and that's why publishers do ask for a lot of money. And I don't blame them, because there's so much risk involved. And nobody knows what's going to work. And nobody, um, they're taking um, uh, a chance. And they're trying to minimize their risk. And I guess. Um, what my old saying about why I self-published the book is because um, because of all these no's that I got, I turned them into yeses, found a way to take a no and transform it into some kind of path that would make uh, this thing happen. And I must say that there were so many things along the way, um, not that I can think of one right this second, but um, where something uh, somebody did something, something happened that gave me a little faith to keep going. Um, and it's really amazing that you feel like, just like when you're taking a picture on the street and something in the universe meets you halfway, the same is for a project like this. That happens too. Okay, so this is the back cover of the book, um, the original back cover. Um, and this is the back cover of the second printer. So, you know, it was great that some of the, the book got some good reviews. And what I realized from being a self publisher who is actually bringing books to bookstores um, and talking to the book buyers and showing them a book, and they said decide to take 10 copies and see what happens. And I guess the fabulous thing is they call you up in a couple of months, say, We ran out of books, can we have some more? So I'd bring them over. But the book comes shrink-wrapped. And I realized that people who don't know who I am, and it's shrink-wrapped, they're not, how many people in this room would open a shrink-wrap of a book in a bookstore just to see what it looks like? So the reason I put the, um, the quotes on the back was maybe to hedge it just a little bit, and maybe some, somebody would read the back and say, take a chance on this book and buy it. Um, and this is the page from the Kickstarter campaign. Um, and I'm really proud of this. It was really hard work. Um, we really tried to figure out uh, 
what the reward, how many people have been on Kickstarter, have seen it? Um, this is actually a, a really interesting um, antidote to the, the idea of the publisher as the gatekeeper. This is a way around that. Um, you can raise the capital that, uh, to produce something like this. Um, if it, you've made a, um, a presentation that people somehow relate to. Okay. Um, maybe I should take some questions before I go to the next section, you know? I'll go back. Okay. Does anybody have a question? What sort of issues do you run into as far as uh, model releases when you take pictures of people on the street and publish? Good question. Um, What's, there's an interesting um, exception in this uh, model release law, and that um, for an artist's monograph, you can use a photo like this without a release. Now, if I took the same photo and used it on a cornflakes box, then I'd be in big trouble. But there's some kind of exception for an artist's monograph that you don't need a release for. But it brings up another interesting question that the cover itself is considered advertising. So you have to be really careful when you make a book that if you put a visible, uh, a face that's recognizable on the cover that you do have it model released. Well, your film background at NYU, did that play a part as you edited the images and did a storytelling? Um, yeah. And how, I think how so? Well, you know, to go back a little further now, I grew up in a family whose my father owned movie theaters. So by the time I was about 10 years old, I had seen um, Antonioni's Blow Up, and all through high school I was watching movies all the time, like Easy Rider, um, uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, and I fell in love with cinematography. Um, and I think everything I've ever done is based on looking at those movies in the dark and looking at how cinematographers handled, fr handled framing and how they handled light. Um, and I think I brought that sensibility when I started shooting on the street. So I think that when I put the book together, I was really conscious that um, even a book is like a little movie, and it has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and you want it to have a narrative, even if it's very, very subtle, and have a catharsis and a dramatic moment, and, <laughs> oops, like that one, and, uh, and, um, and have it sort of tell a story. And I really worked hard on that um, to uh, find that. You know, honestly, I don't know if I did it, but it feels like I did. You know, because when you go over and over and over the order of the book, and what happens is you have a sequence where you have two pages, you know, the double page thing like I was talking about before. So then you have, let's say you have 50 of these, what you consider really great double pages. You still have another problem, which is how do you sequence those and put them in the order of where the book, people flipping the pages. Now one of the interesting things that I discovered when you put a book together is you're, whole, you're looking at the right-hand page and you turn the page over, then you're looking at the other right-hand page before you look to the left. So sometimes what you're trying to do is make that connection as you turn the page that this picture is going to talk to the one on the next page. So you have all these variables and you're just trying to intuitively figure out a way uh, to make looking at the photos not just a pile of photos, but some kind of um, have a narrative, you know? How do they connect together? Uh, I'm thinking it was lucky that you were shooting in Kodachrome, oh, yeah. not in Ektachrome. <laughs> That's <laughs> true. I mean, I, I always forget, but um, Kodachrome was the most archival film ever made. And um, what Tom is saying is that ectochrome is another kind of slide film. Basically, if stuff that I shot, if I had shot it in 1980, it was pretty much faded. But Kodachrome really holds together because it's a dye bleach process. Is that right? No, it's a different different process. But uh, you can explain K14, that. But I no, <laughs> yeah, but I won't. <laughs> um, but I remember uh, around 1982 or something. Somebody told me that the slide sheets that I was storing my Kodachrome slides had PVC in them and that the vapor from the PVC and the plastic would eventually ruin the emulsion. 
So I went out and bought all these archival <coughs> slide sheets and sat on the floor of my apartment for a week, <laughs> switching everything out. And 35 years later, the slides still look as good as the day I shot them. And there's no other film material in the world that's really that good, unless you keep it in a, what, a refrigerator uh, with humidity control, and I couldn't afford that. So, um, you know, basically I have loose leaf books full of Kodachrome slides that still look the way they look. And that's because of the film itself. Um, and part of what I had to do uh, is take those slides and have them drum scanned for the book, which is a big part of the expense of making the book. Um, drum scans are just the most beautiful, accurate, deep, rich um, reproduction of a color. And um, I guess when I finished the book, I realized that the book is the color. And if the color is off in the, in the images, you don't have a book. And part of what that uh, speaks to also, besides having really good scans, is that there's a person, um, I guess you would call them the production person on a book, who figures out how the color is going to translate on the page that the book is actually printed on. Mm -hmm. And I uh, met somebody um, sort of through a roundabout way, which is kind of an interesting story. This is one of the stories that tells you that um, you're on the right track. Um, Alex Webb did a book a few years ago called Suffering the Light, which was probably the best Kodachrome book I'd seen in 30 years. And on the back page it said it was printed in Hong Kong by such and such. So I wrote an email after I found this printing company um, in Hong Kong and wrote them an email and said, who can I print my book with you? That's how beautiful Alex's book was. And they wrote back and said, we're going out of business. I mean, seriously, this is kind of a shock. But then the woman, Karen, was really nice enough to say, uh, the guy who was on press, um, who actually did the color um, when we were printing the book, his name is Matthew Pym. He works at the Museum of Modern Art. Why don't you write him? So I wrote Matthew. And a month later, he writes back after he came back from vacation. Well, I was on press, but I didn't actually do the production. The production was done by this guy in Illinois um, from professional graphics. So I wrote to this guy, Pat Goley, and a month later, he came back from vacation and wrote to me. <laughs> and I met him um, in a coffee shop at 8 o'clock in the morning in New York when he was here doing a, um, a job for the Metropolitan or something. And we hit it off. And he's the one who took my um, original you know, TIFF files or Photoshop files and did the curves that was for the paper that this book was printed on. And he also recommended the printer, which was um, in Canada instead of in Hong Kong or India. And all those things conspire to make something that you're proud of. And it comes from all these kind of, um, I wouldn't call them lucky, but things happen that just make you believe that you're um, on the right track. And I honestly think that without um, Pat Goley's amazing work, the book wouldn't look anywhere as close as good as it does. And I'm really grateful for that. Um, so it's a really long process. And you need lots of help along the way. Yeah. Um, any more questions about self-publishing or the book or anything before I keep going here? OK. Um, this is my new book. It's called The Phone Book. Um, and it's all shot with the iPhone, with the Hipstamatic app. And um, the reason I started shooting with the Hipstamatic app is because I was traveling a lot and I was in Johannesburg. And honestly, I was a little bit afraid of taking out a big Nikon DSLR onto the street the first few days I was there. And I said, well, you know what? Maybe I'll just go out and shoot with my iPhone. And that was back in 2010. And you know, maybe one out of 150 pictures actually worked for me. I'll show you one later. And for some reason, I just kept doing this. And I think the reason I kept doing it is because the iPhone is the camera you have with you all the time. Um, and I always say that you can't get a good picture if you don't have a camera with you. 
And if you accept the limitations of what an iPhone can do, um, within those limitations, good photos could be made. And another reason why I like the idea of using the iPhone is because it reminded me of when I shot the New Yorkers in the first place with a fixed lens, meaning it wasn't a zoom. All the pictures in the New Yorkers were shot with fixed lenses, like a 35 millimeter or a 50 or an 85, which means that if you wanted to change the framing, you couldn't just zoom in. You had to walk. You had to move your body uh, or step back or whatever. Um, and it, it's, it's a completely different experience than um, standing way over here and do, making, zooming into somebody in the back row and getting a, um, a headshot. So an iPhone doesn't have a zoom lens, at least the way I was using it. So it forced me into the same predicament, which is if you want a good picture, um, you've got to move closer. You know, to quote Kappa, Robert Kappa, you know, if you want a good picture, get closer. Um, so I like those limitations. I also like the limitations that the iPhone doesn't have a really wide dynamic range in terms of the color. And it reminded me of shooting Kodachrome, where you have to really get it right on the nose or you weren't going to get a photo. And so I just kept doing it. Um, and after four years, which counterintuitive, let me tell you, to the whole um, powers that be in the photography world for a long time were really um, negative about iPhone photography. Um, all the techies are telling you to get a 36 megapixel uh, file, and these files are very small. At least they were at the beginning. They're getting better. But there was something in me that just said, you know what? This feels right to me. It feels more alive than the stuff I've been shooting with my big DSLR. And I was traveling a lot, and I just kept doing it. And then, of course, I do it in New York all the time. So um, maybe about a year ago, I thought maybe I had a body work. And when I came up with the idea of calling a book the phone book, I think I had something. And, and this is what it came out of that. It's like in a book dummy stage. And hopefully, if all goes according to plan, it will be out uh, next fall. This is the one of the first pictures I made in Johannesburg. And I love this kind of color. Um, it reminds me of the reds in, in Kodachrome. And um, one of the other reasons why I like shooting with the iPhone and the Hipstamatic app, um, this is before the Instagram, by the way, um, is I love shooting squares. And I've tried taking uh, Hasselblad out on the street and shooting squares with that. And it's just too big a camera to um, feel comfortable with. And this was kind of like my way of being able to shoot in a square format after shooting rectangles for 35 years and find a way to enjoy it and make it possible. So um, this is Key West. And this is a storefront with a shark. And here's where you use framing to um, leave out things and make a better picture. There we go. And this is uh, a hot dog place down in, in, um, in Tribeca. I'm just going to flip through these and you can see what, what it looks like. Um, this is in um, Sherman Oaks, California. Um, I'm really proud of this picture because it just goes to show you how um, it's not the camera that you take around with you. It's the subject matter, it's the eye, it's the moment. And it's amazing what you can get if, if you're paying attention. And um, what can I say? Um, this is a self-portrait I did um, last winter in New York near Madison Square Garden. Um, this is actually a, a water, I don't know what you call it, water game or a ride. We were in Honduras and the kids would get in this bubble and they'd push the bubble out into the water. And there's a little door on the other side. And they would go out in the water for a few minutes and it's kind of scary but fun and they come back. But when I saw this on the, on the beach, I'd never seen anything like this. And of course, I just got up and ran over there with the camera I had with me 
the phone, you know, the iPhone, and took the photo. Um, and what's so interesting about all this is that these files are about seven, eight megapixels, I think, and they're JPEGs. But because I went to SVA and I learned something, I learned how to make, uh, I can make a 30 by 30 inch print out of this that'll look really gorgeous. So, I mean, don't be afraid to shoot with um, your iPhone. If you get a really good photo, you can blow it up, right? I mean, you, know, you better agree with me. <laughs> you know that, um, what was it called? Perfect resize. Yeah. No, but I really have made some beautiful prints out of this stuff. And um, I think that's one of the reasons why I kept doing it is because, honestly, if I felt like I couldn't make good prints out of this stuff, I would have stopped. And um, so let me give you, show you some more. Here's where the language of things just works together really well. Um, this is on the beach in California. And like I always say, you know, um, good, a good reflection picture is just so interesting. Um, part of what I like about this is, like I said before, how much can you pack into a frame and it doesn't break apart and it still makes something worth doing. Um, Lafayette Street. Ah, this is the one. Um, this is a straight photograph. This is no Photoshop at all. This is just looking um, in a store window. Does anybody have a guess of what store that is? Apple. Yeah, it's the Apple on 14th Street. Um, I mean, it just blew my mind just that you can do this, that you can pack all this stuff in and say something about um, looking, photography, art history, all that stuff, and somehow um, make it all work. Here's another example of reflections and color out in Flatbush Avenue. And this is in Florida. And that's a self-portrait in the SVA box office window. <laughs> and this is in Mexico in Malinalco. I mean, a part of me is rebelling against all the um, kind of the powers that be about what, how a good photograph is made, you know. And I don't know. I, I get a kick out of it somehow that you can make good photos with this. That's Mexico City, and this is uh, Guggenheim Bilbao, right? Um, And here's uh, a church in Paybask. And this is right around the corner from my house. Um, and this is a reflection in the Flatiron building window with the Metropolitan Life building reflected. You know, basically what I was trying to do is, like, maybe I was getting a little jaded and shooting with the iPhone kind of got me excited again about this, you know? Because it's, it's hard to keep that um, feeling alive after 30 years. And when I started shooting with the iPhone again, I felt like, hey, this is fun. And having fun is good. You know? This is Ankara, Turkey. Uh, this is at the top of the stairs, um, a house on Long Island. Oh, sorry, two of those. And this is a reflection, I mean, looking out a bus window on, uh, on a rainy day. And this is flying into Winnipeg when it was minus 45 degrees where I went to print the book. And we're in a little tiny plane with eight seats. And I, you know, I'll say this over and over again, wherever you are is an opportunity to make a photo. And I don't think it's about succeeding, it's about, it's about process. Okay. Uh, this is Buenos Aires. 
Okay. Um, it's his phone. It's my phone. It's my phone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So here's some juxtapositions that um, my designer in the UK, Nick Phillips, put together the design for this book, and I really think for this book the design is really in integral to um, uh, how it works with that great cover he came up with that looks like a phone. Yeah? Sorry, could you explain the captions? Oh, yeah, hang on. Uh, the captions, yes, if I've got to explain the captions. The caption, um, the caption is the name of the photo, which this one, just for example, is Cartagena, Colombia. And underneath it, um, it has the date it was taken. This is one of the nice things about digital, is that when you bring the pictures into Lightroom, you can find out what the uh, metadata is. So it's got the date of the photo, the time it was taken, and the really cool part is it has the longitude and latitude of where the picture is on the Earth, um, and which I think is kind of interesting. And um, I don't know if you know this, but New York City is 70 degree, 73 degrees north, 40 degrees west, which is nice to know. Um, see, and this is what uh, Nick, the designer, saw the connections between these photos. And I said, well, you see, that's how the whole becomes more than the sum of its parts. Oops. Am I going the right way? Yeah, you see? I know it's a little repetitious, but you see how it changes things when you put them together. And those are both taken on Chamber Street, by the way. And that's the back cover, looks like a phone, too. And that's it. Yeah. On the phone book, the front cover and the back cover, did you have to get permission to be able to use? We're actually figuring that out right now. Um, there's a, a concept called fair use. It's like when, let's say, you're making a, a painting with a, that has a collage, and you take a picture from the newspaper and glue it. Um, you could probably get away with that because it's part of a new whole. Um, so honestly, I'm having an attorney look into whether this is, falls under fair use. And if it does, then we're good to go. So we'll see. Yeah. So far, so good, though. Um, uh, were those, all those images were taken by Hepstomatic? Or yeah, some every one of them. And are you going to credit the, um, the app Absolutely. For Actually, they um, seems like they're going to be willing to promote this. Because uh, they have a big Facebook, uh, 130,000 fans on Facebook, a mm -hmm. big Twitter following, and I've shown them the book, and they seem to be very enthusiastic about it. So does that mean that you're going to have to, on th on the caption of each image, say which kind of filters are you using because they do? The oh, you mean like which film and which? I hope not. Okay. <laughs> All right. But it will. There'll be a credit there somewhere in the back. You know. Hi, I love your images with the phone book. Did you do most of your post-production or processing of the imagery using Lightroom? or? Um, I used a lot of Lightroom for all of them. Basically, the problem with Hipstamatic is some of the pictures came out with a green magenta shift. Uh -huh. And, you know, basically what I did was try to find a way to um, make the picture, find a neutral in it and then color balance to the neutral. And I used Lightroom probably 90% of the time to do some color correction, but that's it. Are you going to have a exhibit when you launch your book, like with large prints yeah. of these images? Yeah, uh, let's hope so. How do we get invited? Oh, it just, um, You'll know about it. Yeah, I mean, just, um, I'll give you a card and you can email me and I'll put you on the mailing list. Postcards. Yeah, yeah. There's postcards over there and books. Um, yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, 
what size of the book, since it'll be square, yeah, are you going to choose? Yeah, it's going to actually, I'll show you. Uh -huh. See, I'm ta I actually uh, took my own advice. I made a book dummy. All right. And this is the size of the book. Seven by seven? Excuse me? Is it seven by seven? I Eight can't by hear you. Seven by seven. Yeah, it's seven by seven. Um, uh, the book's probably going to be a hardcover instead of soft. But the idea of the book, um, I think it's a good size for these images. But the other idea, I mean, is a commercial idea. You know, the book's going to sell for somewhere between $20 and $25. And hopefully it'll be on the counter when you check out of the bookstore and you'll see it. And hopefully this cover will catch your eye. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's I, what am I going to say? I just hope it works. That's all. <laughs> Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, what's your take of t taking photos of subjects with or without their permission? Um, you know, that's kind of the dilemma that all street photographers have. If you ask somebody's permission, maybe the moment is already gone. Um, so every time you take a picture, um, you're balancing you're being true to what you're trying to do as a photographer. You're also trying to balance uh, the respect you have for other people. And honestly, every situation, um, all of these thoughts go through my head where I make a decision that it's okay to take the picture. I'll tell you the truth, the best pictures I've ever taken, I never took. Because I just didn't feel like it was the right situation. I didn't feel comfortable. It had already passed. You know, that's part of the deal. You know, um, and maybe it is a little bit unfair that I'm photographing on the street, um, but I really don't mean any disrespect to anybody. So, has anyone, has anyone, um, been upset or? I'd say two or three times in 30 years, <laughs> really. You know, I got mugged once. Um, oh, yeah, well, there's a really good story about um, in Argentina. Uh, I took a picture of a beautiful storefront, and it's actually in the book, but it's not in the slideshow. Um, I mean, this is going to be kind of dumb to just hold it up, but I took this photo, oops, this photo, um, and the guy in the photo is just coming out of the store, and he saw me take the picture with the iPhone, and um, he came over to me and he said, you can't take my picture. And I said, I said, I'm sorry, and I'm sorry wasn't good enough. And then I tried to walk away, and he wouldn't let me walk away. Every time I went like this, he would get in front of me. Um, and ev this went on for like five minutes of me trying to get away from this guy. And a crowd is gathering. Um, this is I'm in a foreign country in Argentina maybe two days, and this is what's happening. Um, and there's probably 30, 40 people watching this now. And then I actually tried to get in the cab, and he wouldn't let me get in the cab. He blocked the door of the cab. And luckily, there was a guy there who was an, um, a guy who used to live in New York, who was Argentine, who um, was an English language teacher. So he was translating what I was saying to him and translating what he was saying to me. And he kept saying, I'm going to call the police. So he actually did call the police. So the police show up with this big crowd and this guy trying to not let me go. And um, uh, this nice guy was explaining to the policeman what was going on. And he asked the store owner to go in the back of behind the police car and I'm in the front of the police car. And he listened to the store owner for a while and he said, you know, what you've just done is borders on kidnapping. Basically what he was doing is holding me against my will and it's not against the law to take a photo in the street, even in Argentina. And so basically, um, you know, I walked away from that. But I found it such a, it was really traumatic for me. Because I really felt like, you know, um, I wasn't going to hit this guy. I, I felt like he almost pushed me into a plate glass window. And I just had to be really calm and uh, let the little drama play it out. And this is my revenge. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Yeah, I actually did delete it for him. He asked me to delete it, and I deleted it, and he said that wasn't good enough. This is the really interesting thing, is when you shoot a hipstamatic photo, it saves it in the hipstamatic <laughs> folder, and it saves a copy in your photos folder on the iPhone. So I deleted the hipstamatic one, and I still had the other one. <laughs> and he still didn't care. It wasn't good enough. But you ultimately won't say that he's withholding anything. Yeah, I know. It doesn't make sense what he was doing, you know, and I'm not going to... Maybe he was a witness for something. What's that? Maybe he was a witness. I don't know. What he said to me was that somebody would, if I took a photo, somebody would be able to steal his store, what? which made no sense to me. Oh. He thought you were chasing him. Yeah, maybe he did. Hang on. Hang on. The same experience here in New York. Uh, I had almost exactly the same experience here in New York. I was taking a picture of a store, I don't know, somewhere between Broadway and 6th in the 20s. And the guy who was the owner of the store came out and started yelling at me and telling me I couldn't take the picture. And I just said, I'm sorry. And I walked away. I didn't have the, yeah. the continuing problem with it. But it was the same kind of thing. I never yeah. did really figure it out. But it's kind of like interesting that no, I mean, we had similar experiences. It is, it's like kind of scary even when it happens to you in New York. <laughs> and, you know, honestly, most of the time when people tell me that they don't want me to take their picture, I'm really fine. You know, who cares? There's always another photo, in, you know, around the corner. Um, but this thing in Argentina was really, seems so over the top. And, you know, Argentina's history is pretty dark in the last 25 years. So a lot of stuff goes through your head in a few minutes. And honestly, for the next couple of days, I was not that comfortable just shooting on the street. I kind of had to get over that. Yeah. Um, hi, Robert. It's great to be here. Hi. Uh, I heard you say, and uh, if you would correct me if I missed something, but when for this particular book, you uh, just adjusted slightly through Lightroom, about 90% of the time, color to yeah. a, a neutral color, right? Yeah, but, and but probably sometimes I push the blacks a little bit mm -hmm. or brought in the highlights. Mm. But, you know, it's not like I'm using Photoshop to do layers and uh, change things around at all. I uh, mean, the Hipstamatic app creates whacked colors to begin with, which is part of the charm of it. Um, the only time I use Photoshop is when I blow the pictures up mm -hmm. and I use... Um, uh, perfect resize um, from on one software, which is really clean um, in terms of um, you know changing a file from let's say seven by seven inches to fifteen by fifteen or thirty by thirty. So, uh, other than that, is there do you make much or any adjustment in terms of cropping or the picture I, is as shot? Three pictures, yeah. There's probably two or three pictures in the whole book that are cropped. But all of, most 99% of them are the way I shot it. Wow. And part of the fun part is that the borders are in a lot of those photos. Yeah. Are the borders that the Hipstamatic app makes. Mm. You know? I mean, I don't have a problem with cropping, but, you know, kind of the fun challenge of shooting is trying to get it right. You know? Not that that, to me, is anything that important anymore. I mean, your idea and your vision is more important than whether you crop or not. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of nice when you get it right. Yeah. You know, I also wanted to say that the first time you showed me those two uh, instamatic pictures that you had taken, one of the, the beach ball uh, and the other of the birds, Yeah. Uh, I couldn't believe that you had taken them from an mm. instamatic camera and now, or from your iPhone. And the fact that now you have a book about it is, is terrific. Thanks. Congratulations, really. Thank so you. It, it, I actually, I, I still don't know if I believe you took the one of the birds with that camera, but <laughs> I'll, take, I'll, take, I'll take it at your word for the moment. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true, it really is, you know. Um, and, you know, back in, in the 70s, people started making pictures with instamatics and Polaroid SX70 cameras. And, you know, even 100 years ago, people were making photos with crappy cameras, and people look at their photos today. So, you know, I don't really think it's about the camera. It's about your eye and, um, I don't know, your enthusiasm or whatever. Yeah. I was going to close up. I grew up in the city in the 70s, and I feel that um, it's gotten so crowded here 
I can't even imagine taking those photographs you took back then now. Yeah. Do you think there's any, ch <laughs> there's just no. Well, you know, I have two answers. One, yeah, I get it. The city's like a mall now. It's all corporate. All the good stuff is closing every day. Um, but on the other hand, half the pictures in this iPhone book were taken in the streets of New York. And there's still something there to take a picture of. It's not the same. I mean, honestly, I miss Soho the way it used to be. But, um, you know, photography is all about looking, and there's still stuff to look at. You know, it's just the thing that's different about shooting now and then is people are so much more hyper aware of what photography means, how it um, can go viral around the world. So they're much more self conscious. And they're actually, I think, shooting with a DSLR on the street is much harder than it used to be. But shooting with an iPhone is like the greatest stealth camera in the world. You look like you're looking at your email, but you're really taking a photo. <laughs> so that's a really cool thing, actually. Yeah. That's great. Thanks. Thank you, Robert. Okay. Uh, for tonight. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. You guys are great.